and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and we are so honored to have author Marlon James with us today. His current book is Black Leopard, Red Wolf. He describes it jokingly as the African Game of Thrones. His book, A Brief History of Seven Killings, won the 2015 Man Booker Prize. Now, that's a very big deal in the book world. And his earlier works, John Crow's Devil and the Book of Night Women, caused a major stir and gave him the title of one of the best writers we have in the world. Marlon, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us Thanks today. for having me. How does it feel to be one of the best writers in the world? I don't know. I hope it shows on my paycheck. Oh, uh, uh, like <laughs> I'm sure it will. Uh, don't you have a deal with Michael B. Jordan to do the We film? do, yeah. And, um, and we're moving ahead with it. And they're, they're super excited. So this will be, you're writing a trilogy, so mm -hmm. we have two more books. Will the others be 700 pages long as well? I'm just plotting I'm out my you know next what? I'm, I'm few trying years. To, I'm trying yeah. to keep it together, maybe <laughs> around 600. 600. These characters just have a lot to say. So. Ah, <laughs> right, right, right. So now, as I understand, I, I'm, I want to tell you, as I feel like one of the reviewers uh, who mm. wrote about your, this book saying, if you survive reading Marlon J's book. <laughs> You know, because it, it is so rich, the language. Mm -hmm. And I must also tell you, the violence of it, mm -hmm. too, is very, very powerful. Yeah. So I find myself putting it down and taking a breath and yeah. resuming resuming yeah. the read. But I think you should... I, I, I'm more concerned... I'm very concerned about violence where people don't take a break. Oh, are you? Where people so I'm don't. doing the right thing yeah. and saying, Yeah, because okay. violence is not normal. Right. It's not, it's not normal behavior. I think we are so used to a kind of Hollywood violence where the action hero kills 30 people, kisses a girl, and they walk off in the sunset, and everybody's <laughs> cool with it. I'm like, no, 100 people just died. Right. And I think there is a difference between preponderance, too much, too much of something, right. and resonance, which is there isn't a lot, but each, everything echoes and resonates and lingers and leaves a stain. And I think that's what happens in, you know, with the violent scenes in, in my book. Right, right. Well, it's, you know, it's beautifully written. I, and I love uh, when reading about how you put this together, of what you had to do. For, yeah. I mean, because you are really taking apart language and yeah. putting it together in a, in a brand new way. Talk about that a bit. Well, first, I had to take apart English. Um, growing up in Jamaica, uh, one thing that's very different, I think, from growing up a, a black American is that we still learn colonial English. Mm, right. And, um, and it took me a while before I realized that every time I opened my mouth, I sounded like the butler. <laughs> um, so I had to unlearn all of that. Right. Um, and, um, and also, I was still going to write in English, but I didn't want to play by English rules. So studying languages like Wolof mm -hmm. and realizing things like in, in Wolof, for example, verbs are always present tense. Which is interesting, because in Jamaica and Patoa, verbs are also present tense. We just thought it was bad English. That's what you were told. That's what I was told. Right. Um, the term, no, it's not. It's, it's one of those things that, you know, the slave ship just couldn't kill. And the idea that action is always present tense, that we're on this, and, 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 and I see, and we see it. Sometimes there's a reason why all of us sometimes still talk about the past in present tense. And I don't think we realize that we do it. Right. It's, it's because of that, that time is, on, time is on a continuum. And that was one of the things I had to learn and, then a, and use that right down to how I use grammar. Right. So this is a, a trilogy. There mm -hmm. will be three versions of this. And will Michael B. Jordan uh, be doing the whole series? Is that I what hope you so. talked about? <laughs> Right. Well, they, they, I mean, they bought the trilogy. How do you cast this, though? I, that's what I tried to I'm imagine. I'm trying to think, how do we get somebody who's not on Black Panther? <laughs> um, it's, you know what, it's, um, because it's, it's so rich, and also the way the trilogy works is that part two is not a continuation of part one. Part two is a complete retelling of the story. Right. Um, doing three versions Three of versions of the same story. Right. So different characters will see things differently. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the second narrator may very well, you know, say, no, Tracker was not tall. He was actually four feet high. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and we end up recasting. And that's a great thing for me as a writer is, funny enough, doing it this way, I get to sort of rewrite a brand new book with the same, um, the same ingredients. And that hopefully will show in the film as well. 
Now, we, I've read that one of the reasons that you did this book was because you were sick and tired of there not being a black hobbit in Lord of the Rings. This happened out of an argument I had with a friend of mine. Right. Because I think it was a hobbit. It was a cast for the show. It wasn't the right. movie. It wasn't the, right. sorry, it wasn't the, it wasn't the, uh, the novel. It was in the cast for the film. And I raised the question, I always raise, it's 2000 and whatever year it was. Why is this not more diverse? Right. Why can't we have better representation? And the argument went the way it always goes. And, um, and the friend was pushing back saying, it's a British story. It's mm -hmm. about British mythology and it's about such and such. And I said to him, you know, a lot of the rings isn't real. Mm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And you, may, right, that's a very a very fine point to uh, yeah. to, to make there. Yeah. So you, we, so you can do anything you, you can want. You can do anything you want with it. And that's what you've done. Yeah. And I said, and after a while, I said, you know what? You can keep your myth. Um, right. So I went searching for a lot of African history and mythology, not to write a book, just to find, just to know. Right. Because it's one thing to argue with a guy about European mythology, but then when I looked around, I realized I didn't know my own, and. Um, it's funny enough, I was, I was giving the Tolkien lecture this year, and I was talking about what happens to people when they don't have their mitts, mm. and what happens when they do. Mm -hmm. For example, in the UK, King Arthur, right. Camelot. Right. That's essential for British people, because it gives them the myth that they were always civilized. This was one of the most backward places in Europe. <laughs> uh, they were living in basically dung huts until the Romans right. showed up. Sure, sure. But, but they have King, King Arthur. Arthur makes you think we were always gallant <laughs> and we were riding our white horses through the bushes. It's a total myth, but it's essential. Mm -hmm. So to somebody like myself who grew up thinking ground zero is slavery, I realize what happens when I don't have my mythologies. And where did you go to find that? Oh, where where everywhere. did you do that research? Everywhere. Um, well, first I had to disregard any book on African history written before 1970. Before 19, right? Okay, because I see usually, why. yeah. yeah right. Um, the thing is, there's so much work happening. Um, a lot of archaeology. Mm -hmm. um, I was in Abiokuta in Nigeria, mm -hmm. which was one of these sort of cradles of civilization, um, reading all the the epics. Most of which have been translated, mm -hmm. and, um, and well, that's serious. That's serious research. Well, I had to. For one, you know, yep. and it's funny because I wasn't writing a historical novel. I was writing a fantasy. I couldn't make it up. Right, right. But every time I went to make up fantasy, I saw Brothers Grimm. Mm -hmm. I saw Snow White and the Seven Dwarves because mm -hmm. that's what I grew up with. So to unlearn all of that, and not just unlearn that, but unlearn, unlearn the value system behind that, because it's a different thing. You go to the Omo Valley, it's a different thing. Lower Ethiopia, Upper Kenya, Central Africa, it's a different value system. So I had to unlearn everything to write it. Well, uh, uh, the book is fantastic, <laughs> you. you know, and as you know, I, I'm, I'm making my way through it <laughs> and loving it. I do want to say, Definitely get it. Definitely read it. It will change your mind about so much. Mm -hmm. And the research that you did for yourself mm -hmm. uh, is something that you're now being able to share with the rest of the world, yeah. which is fantastic. You know, I said to you before we start, the mm -hmm. first question I usually mm -hmm. ask a guest is to place yourself in black America mm -hmm. and how that's influenced you. Yeah. You just got here relatively recently. You grew up in Jamaica. In Jamaica. Uh, I, I, the thing, the reason why I love the question is because the uh, the black immigrant to America has a whole, usually has a whole different story about black America and how they're embracing black America. Um, I remember once somebody asked me years, years, years ago, "Are you a black writer?" Mm. And I'm like, mm. "No, I'm just a writer. Can't I just be a writer?" Right. And um, one of my mentors, a fantastic novelist, she said, "You know, you want you should put a sock in that." And she talked about how years, years, years ago when Abner Louima was yes. attacked by the police and how the Caribbean community was completely silent until black Americans said something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the idea of community and support is something that black America, black America is what taught. The rest, of, the rest of, quite frankly, the black world. Um, when I look at heroes, yes, a Frederick Douglass, W.E. Du Bois, or so on, that the whole idea of personhood before I even came to America came from black America. And that's important when you grow up British colonial 
Because even somebody like me who grew up in the 80s, you're still kind of raised as subjects of empire. Mm -hmm. And we still, there's still people in Jamaica who think, man, things were so much better when we were a colony. Mm, they or, actually. Yeah. Or we hear yeah. this. We Jamaicans love to say, oh, it's not about race, it's class. And I'm uh, like, well, of that course. That sounds like a very Jamaican thing. My husband was Jamaican. Yeah. That sounds like a very Jamaican Precisely. thing. Precisely. And I'm like, oh, well, of course you think that. That's what colonialism right. taught you. Right. Then you go to England and you see the sign, no Irish, no blacks, no such and such. And you think, oh, that doesn't appeal. That, that's, that's not me. Right. It's like it's totally you. So the, the, the idea of personhood, the idea that as a writer, the idea that the voice coming out of my head is legitimate enough to tell a story. Mm. It seems simple, but I really did not know that. I did not know that until I read Toni Morrison. Toni, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I love hearing the, your description of your life as a child growing up in mm. Jamaica, mostly in your bedroom. Uh, you were, <laughs> you were uh, isolated. You isolated yourself mm -hmm. to some extent, and you drew comics, and, mm -hmm. I mean, which brings us back to this wonderful... Yeah you know, work that you've, uh, you've created. So mm. talk to us. Well, I mean, I was a nerd. You were... <laughs> <I> was a, <laughs> um, you know, I love comics. I love the X-Men. I, I tell people reading X-Men is a lot like being an X-Men. Because, you know, being a nerd, being picked on in high school by the same people who turn around and have you do their homework for them. Ah, uh, yes. I was like, I I'm hope a... you got paid for it. No. 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 I was a total mutant. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I'm an X-Men. I'm here saving the world that doesn't want me. <laughs> Um, but, you know, that also meant reading tons of books and discovering books and mm -hmm. finding, finding a life in book. I, th I don't remember who said it. Said, you know, I, she, I read because I want to have more than one life. Mm -hmm. and I love that. I yeah. love that. And, I, and, I, and that made me escape into reading. And after a while, if you're a writer, you come across a book that makes you go, I want to write like that. And what book was that for you? Uh, there were so many. I think one of the first was uh, Dog Eaters by a Filipino writer, Jessica Hagedorn. Oh, really? Huh? And I remember reading this novel and thinking, this is the greatest novel about Jamaica ever written, <laughs> and it's set in the Philippines. Uh, uh. Because if you grew up in Kingston sure. or, yeah, or Manila or Mexico City, you understand, uh, this is where I explain it, we're always, we're always gravitating between a political election and a beauty contest. And the minute I said that, somebody in Manila knows, yeah. Or somebody in Mexico knows, oh, yeah. Right. I, I love uh, the, the, your, your Seven Killings that mm -hmm. won the Man Booker Prize was about Mar Bob Marley. Right. Sort of. Your mother was a detective in Jamaica, mm -hmm. your dad also, and then you, you tell me that he later became a lawyer. Yeah. What's, what's the family story? Your mother put them in jail and your father... Yeah, my, basically, that's, they, keep, they kept each other employed. My mother put them in jail and my dad took them back out. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but, but, but Bob Marley's shooting, you know, mm. was really traumatic for Jamaicans. And, and you mm. said it was the first time you saw your, your mother concerned, afraid. Yeah, because she was very big on making us feel safe. It was, it's one thing being a cop in Jamaica. It's another thing being a female cop mm -hmm. in Jamaica. Being a female cop in Jamaica, you're almost permanently a target. Mm. None of this I knew. I just thought my mom just went to work and won't come home early. Wow. Um, it's just now I'm realizing what she was juggling. Right. But there, but there are few, there were very few occasions where she let that sort of confidence slip. And one was when Bob Marley, when they tried to kill him, because it was just an unwritten rule in Jamaica: nobody touches the tough gang. Right. Was, you know, people who would be killing each other would be having parties or playing dominoes at, at Bob Marley's house. Mm -hmm. So the idea that they would try to kill him, even the idea that they would, would invade his house, which was this big sanctuary in Kingston, was just unheard of. And I think for a lot of people, like my parents, the idea was, well, if they're going to go after Bob Marley, they'll go after anybody. Anybody, right. That was the, re the revelation mm -hmm. of, of, of danger. Now, you won the Man Booker Prize, I say, a very big deal in the book world. Yeah. What, what do you think of this? And now that you're winning almost every award, <laughs> <laughs> you know, as expected, mm. you know, I love the, the, the description of the discussion in mm -hmm. the Man Booker Prize when they were talking about your, your book, and apparently you won it in 10 minutes, you know, the first 10 yeah. minutes of the discussion. <laughs> But, but what value do you actually put on that? I know we've interviewed Lisa mm. Lucas from the National Book Award, mm -hmm, and I know mm -hmm. she's made big changes and had to in terms of yeah. who are the judges. 
you know, what are the values? Mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about. I think that's that. it exactly. It's, it's, the prize doesn't mean anything if it doesn't translate a value. Mm. And I think for, certainly for me and for the, for the Booker Prize, I do write the kind of books that don't necessarily fly off the shelves on their own. They're challenging. You have to meet them halfway. They're written in Jamaican patois. Mm -hmm. they, we don't, you know, they rarely have the sort of token white character so middle America can latch on to it. Right. Um, that's what was said to you about your early writing, your book, when you first tried to get your books published. People yeah. were upset because there were no white people. Yeah, it, was a, it, was, it would have been far easier, certainly back then, to sell it as a sort of conflicted white adventurer <laughs> who lands in the third world. Right, right. And those stories are still being told. Right. Um, so, but, but, but the prize, the prizes, yeah. yeah. But I think something like the Booker Prize made people who wouldn't normally have picked up a book like that pick it up. Some, of course, immediately threw it down. It's like, this is not my kind of book, <laughs> which is fine. Right. But I think a lot of other people were open to reading about a world that was totally different, which is what we should do with fiction anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense, yeah, an award can, can change things uh, you know, for the better. I think there, there is no escaping. Sometimes it's, it's sort of the industry patting itself on the back. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it's the book industry. We, we, need, we need all the patting we can get. Right, right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I want to talk to you about your writing life. How do mm -hmm. you, uh, I, I was very interested in your saying that you actually get dressed up to write, where mm -hmm. most other people, we assume, are writing in their bathrobes. Oh, good for but, them. <laughs> but you, you actually put on a... Yeah, I, I get dressed and I go to work. And where do you, in your home, do you have a home? No, I, don't, I can never work at home. Right. I... I I learned my lesson after three or four tries. I'd have a full home office and never go in there. <laughs> right. I just can't work from home. So right. I've always, brief, a brief history was written in just cafes all over Minnesota. Ah, and where I, you teach. Yeah, yeah. and right. I thought, I can't do that again. So now I work in an office. I, yeah, I get dressed, I jump on a train, I head to work, I get there at around 10, I write till six. Every day. Every or, day. And, uh, and it's, yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's work, and you know, without the, the connotations about it's, it being a job, it's a vocation or whatever. But when I write, I go to work. Mm. That's why I, um, I remember somebody saying, talking to me about being inspired to write. And I'm like, wow, I haven't been inspired since the first Bush administration. <laughs> How do you do that? I just do the it's work. It's not inspirational. In fact, you say that you're terrified every page. Yeah. Every page I, that you write, yeah, maybe your maybe mm. your first blank page that you can't figure out. Yeah, anything to. and I think that's healthy. Yeah. I, that came because I think somebody was talking. We're we're talking about cultural appropriation, and a white writer was saying, "In this atmosphere, they feel scared to write." Mm. And I'm like, "You weren't scared before." <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrified right. every time I see a black page. Right, right. That's so interesting. And how mm. many revisions do you go through? Uh, mm. So a, for a 700-page book like Black Leopard, Red Wolf. Even a 700-page book, probably at least three or four. Three or four, top to bottom. Yeah, I've done nine for a book. Really? Well, I write pretty fast um, because I spend, my writing process, I spend so much just figuring out what I want to say. That can take years. Right. Like the actual writing of this book was like a year and three months. Which is very it's little. It's very quick. Time. But the time I spent to put it together was like three years. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So um, it's all in the prep for it. Right. The, all of that research. And, and all. I want to talk quickly about your exorcism <laughs> because you have that in your history that so few other people have. Uh -huh. So... Talk to us a little bit about. I mean, it's that's funny because I was also I was also kind of an exorcist. It was funny when I had to have it. It's it's you know I I, um, I was a part of evangel the evangelical church and um, the church still thinks a lot of things are demons like homosexuality and so on. It's a demon. You need to get rid of it. And I and I remember um, thinking that. And, um, you think, thought that, yeah, that you, yeah. Were, that you were possessed by yeah, because a pray, well, praying away the gay wasn't working, right? So you, I'm prayed, like, you prayed it away, yeah. So right. we, we need to bring in the the, the big guns, <laughs> and it was yeah. I, I went. I didn't even go to my own church because we couldn't let the news get out, right? So I went to a neighboring church, and yeah, they sat me down nine in the morning and was just driving out evil spirits all the way till twelve. Really? In the really? afternoon, and I went like, you left your thinking, oh, I'm free. <laughs>
you know? No, I'm dating a dude. So. <laughs> Well, I'm glad it didn't work. You see, know? I, keep I, thinking, mean, see, I keep thinking it did. You did? Oh, I you think that's it did. what? I think, I think, I, I actually think, I think if, if there's a God, God is a lot smarter and a lot funnier than his followers. So God I, got, yeah. he, he got the result that he yeah, wanted, I was like, she wanted. Yeah, right? I was like, yeah, I'm clear now. I was like, thanks, Jesus. <laughs> So, so what's in in the future? I know that you're working on mm -hmm. these books. Uh, so, how much time will it be before we see volume two and volume three? Well, my publisher thinks volume two is coming out in 2021, which will be two years from now. Wow! Um, which is what which is definitely what we're aiming for. Right. I'm also working on a few TV series. Ah. Um, so one's original. It's called Get Millie Black because I grew up watching Get Christy Love. Ah. Um, so it's about a, a, a you know a black woman detective in Jamaica, half Jamaican, oh. half British. Is that your mom? She thinks so. <laughs> she already you know threatened me to con come on and consult. Right, right. I'm she like, mom, you're maybe she wants to play the part. Right. I don't know. I'm like, mom, you're 84. You think you can handle it? <laughs> um, so I'm working on yeah, we're working on 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 that this book and trying to turn brief history into a TV show as well. Oh, oh, really? Mm -hmm. Ah, oh my goodness. So that would be, that would be something. That would be something to recreate Jamaica in the 70s with right, such a with, huge cast. Right, all about Bob Marley. Mm -hmm. So who are the writers who, uh, well, inspiration may be mm -hmm. too strong of a word, the wrong word, but no, who, who, I'm, from inspiration who you is get something? But, um, well, we talked about Toni Morrison before, absolutely right. Toni Morrison in, in different ways. Um, Sula, for example, the big influence Sula had on me was not my writing, it was how I lived my life. Mm. Um, you know, um, there is um, near the end of Sula where um, Sula is dying and Nell comes back to confront her because Sula slept with Nell's husband and destroyed the friendship. Mm -hmm. And Sula is saying, like, I sure did live in this world. And Nell says, oh, what do you have to show for it? Oh. And I'm like, yes, Sula, what do you have to show for it down here alone? Right, right. And Sula says, show to who? Ah. And wow. Wow. That, that, was, that was a jaw-dropping moment for me. Right. We were talking about the documentary about Tony mm -hmm. Morrison, Pieces of Me, which is, I think is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. But the thing that you saw that most of us let fly by was mm. the diagramming that you, yeah. think that you did for her book. She was literally showing the backbones of her novels. And I thought I would do a whole documentary just on that. As a writer, I'm very, I'm still curious about how people write mm -hmm. and how people, how they get their ideas and build story. And to see those scribbles on that re on the right. yellow notepad, it's like, I just want to be locked in a room with that for a day. I know. I, have, I got ordered the documentary. I'm yeah. going to look more closely at that <laughs> when I watch it tonight. Who else inspires you? Um, Tony, of course. Yes. Uh, Jessica Hagedorn, of course. Um, hmm. Salman Rushdie. Yes, who is a friend of yours. Yeah. Got, I would love to... You know, sit in in a conversation that you two yeah. are having about the world we just and about struggle, writing. We what just struggle about the English we learned. <laughs> you know, we have to unlearn it. Right. Um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Ah. Um, absolutely. Um, David Bradley, who isn't read a lot anymore. He wrote the Chainersville Incident. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, of course. Um, he writes only nonfiction now. Uh-huh. Um, but that novel was a, had a huge... Huge impact on right. me. Right, and, and nonfiction in your future as well. Do you? Um, I mean, you've I've got read the essays every now and then. Yeah, essays, but you've got the podcast. Coming yeah, up too, with your editor. Yeah, so yeah, me and my usually so usually anytime anybody walked in on me and my editor, we're arguing about a book. Right. Usually by a long, long dead author, and somebody said, "You guys should make this a show," so we did. And it's called Marlon and Jake Read Dead People. I love the title. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I got the explanation that it's dead authors, right? Yeah. So but did you say not recently dead? Not recently <laughs> dead. Um, the last one I was going on about why Wuthering Heights is a terrible novel. Ah, really? really? Wuthering Heights? You're, you guys are taking that on. Well, he likes it. Right. Because so, we argue. I'm like, no, no, it's not Jane Eyre. Right, so be sure to look for the podcast <laughs> yeah. from Marlon James. Uh, final thing, the power to the strength of black America, mm -hmm. in a couple of words, as a brilliant writer. How do you define that when you look at black America and what? When I look at black America, I see family. Mm. 
I see family. It's, it's um, every time I step into, let's call it a black room, I feel like I'm stepping into a homecoming. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Well, Marlon James, thank you so much for being with us today. I can't wait Thanks to hear the me. podcast. It's up in <laughs> next year, the January, beginning. Yeah. January, right? And yep. I, I'm anxiously awaiting the next editions of, um, <laughs> you know, Black Leopard, Red Wolf. Thank I'm you. anxious to interact them. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. And I can imagine you getting on the subway and going to work to write them. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here today. And thanks to you out there for watching us. We'll see you the next time. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America.